nerve signals, and we're going to look at action potential and a brief mention on synaptic transmission. The axon resting potential is what the nerves are sitting at when they are not firing. And so remember the axon being the long body part of the nerve itself. They have a bunch of sodium ions that are pumped outside of the cell. And there are more of them on the outside than there are these potassium ions on the inside. Plus there's other ions as well. So we end up with a negative charge on the inside and a positive charge on the outside. This difference in charge can be measured in millivolts and it works out to be about 70 negative 70 millivolts in terms of the resting voltage between the inside and the outside of the cell. So if you actually put a voltmeter on the inside and the outside of these nerve cells, you'd get a reading of negative 70 millivolts because there's a positive charge on the outside and a negative charge on the inside. Lots of sodium ions on the outside, not as many positive charged ions on the inside, and so therefore they're outweighed by the, the other negative things, the, the negative charged proteins and whatnot on the inside. This setup is essentially a gradient and as such, it has the potential to do something. So this is essentially how nerve impulses are going to be sent down the axon of the nerve cells themselves, down the axon, the long part of the nerve. Um, this potential setup here, and again, that's electrical potential, and then, but it is very much a potential that could be changed in order to send a signal down the axon. So we call this sending of the signal down the axon, um, the changing of the polarization of the membrane, we call it an action potential, or just AP for short. So this is a change in the membrane potential, and again, of the voltage of the membrane itself. So normally, the nerve cells are sitting there with a resting potential, uh, more positive on the outside, fewer on the inside, and therefore the, the outside is positive, the inside is negative, with a resting potential of negative 70 millivolts. Then if there is a stimulus, it will cause this voltage to change. So essentially, if it changes enough, if it, if it um, goes from a negative 70 increasing to a negative 50, because the stimulus itself causes some of those ions to move from one side to another, and this can decrease this resting potential. Um, if it gets to the point where you actually have a decrease to, or I guess it's an increase, it's becoming more positive, less negative. Um, so it increases to negative 50 millivolts, then this action potential will take place. Anything less than that, so a small enough signal, will just be ignored. It will not cause this cascading series of events. If it is, enough if it does get to negative 50 millivolts what happens is there's a series of, of things that happen within the membrane itself first one being that the voltage gated and again they're voltage gated they don't trigger until you're at negative 50 millivolts if it's at like negative 60 it's not going to work negative 65 um not going to work negative 70 just the resting potential um so it does have to get all the way up to negative 50 again we're going more positive here, um, then these particular voltagated channels open up and the sodiums that are on the outside are going to flow through. Because remember, there's, a, there's this potential gradient of the sodium on the outside. So if you open up these channels, the sodium is going to rush to the inside of the cell. And again, that's that's where the negative charges are, the positive on the outside. If these ne positively charged sodium ions rush into the cell, then the cell itself, that voltage that we had is not going to be what it was. It's not definitely not going to be negative 70 more, and it was got, it brought up to negative 50. Bringing more sodium ions in is going to bring it up even further. So we call this depolarization, and it actually goes quite a bit on the positive side. So these positive sodium ions rush into the point where the actual potential difference between the inside and outside goes from negative 70 all the way up to positive 40. At this point, these channels are going to, these other channels are going to kick in. And so the sodium channels are going to close. Voltage gated potassium channels are going to open. And so remember the, the, the inside of the cell at this point here during depolarization, the inside has become positive. And that's where the sodium, oh, sodium ions were to begin with. So if those sodium channels open, the sodium is going to rush out of the cell and it will start to get back to what it was um, in terms of the original resting potential. So we call this repolarization. So it, the, the, it got depolarized by bringing all the positives on the inside. And then this movement of potassium ions is going to cause the nerve cell to repolarize, reestablishing that positive on the outside, negative on the inside. 
The sodium and potassiums are going to pump in, kick in as well. Sodium and potassium pumps are going to kick in and start exchanging the sodiums and the potassiums um, back to their resting potential side. But what happens is while this is, is taking place, while all these sodium uh, potassium ions sorry, are running in with the sodium ions already being in there, we end up with some hyperpolarization. So it actually gets all the way down to negative 90 millivolts. Um, and then again, as these potassiums are moved out, um, as the sodium potassium pumps do their thing, the initial state of negative 70 millivolts at the resting potential will be reestablished. So this whole sequence of events is called an action potential. And it happens for each part of the membrane. So while one part is going through this action potential, it'll actually cause the next part, like the neighboring part of the cell membrane, to start to go through these as well. And you get this cascading series of events being passed down along the membrane of the axon. So the entire process is going to start at one point and then it'll move down the axon. Here it is graphically with millivolts on the y-axis here and then we're looking at time very quick um, on the x-axis here. So again its resting potential is negative 70. If there is a stimulus that only gets up to like negative 60 or I don't know negative 55 even um, nothing will happen. It just goes back to its normal negative 70 resting potential. But as soon as we cross that threshold of negative 50, as um, soon as there is enough movement of ions because of a stimulus um, that the cell potential rises to negative 50, then we get this cascading depolarization. The sodium ions rush into the cell. And so you end up with all these positives inside the cell. And that gives us a, a relatively high um, membrane potential. The sodium, potassium channels will open. The potassium is going to move back, um, or I shouldn't say back. The potassium will move out of the cell. And so this is called repolarization. The sodium potassium pumps will reestablish which side is which and put the sodiums on the outside, potassiums on the inside. But again, as that's happening, it's, it's, it's this whole repolarization. You're basically pumping those positives back to the outside. And we do it to the extent that we actually end up with a bit of hyperpolarization goes a little too far and then eventually we'll get back to its resting potential. Once it's at its resting potential, then the nerve that or at least that part of the membrane of the nerve is ready to fire again and do another action potential. Well, it is recuperating here um, this this uh, part where it is repolarizing, hyperpolarizing and then getting back to normal. The that part of the membrane cannot fire again. It can't go through this X potential. There's a certain time delay between when these can be fired. And therefore, there's a slight delay which allows this signal to be passed further down the neuron before it can be reset up. So you only have one way for the signal to travel. So let's go over that in a little bit more detail. So imagine this is the membrane here. Um, so inside where the words are, that's inside the cell. On the outside, we have these positive sodium ions. Inside we have potassium ions as well as some other negatively charged things. And so we end up with this negative 70 millivolt potential between the inside and the outside. The sodium potassium pumps are working away. They're using ATP to keep the concentration of sodium high on the outside and potassium high on the inside. But since there's more sodiums positively charged, there's a overall positive charge on the outside, negative charge on the inside. So this is the, the setup for it. This is the resting potential. When a stimulus is great enough, it starts this depolarization wave. So all that stuff we were talking about in terms of what's happening, the action potential, that's going to be happening at one particular spot in the membrane. So just this, this one area here is where you'd have that action potential taking place. And then it can happen in the spot next to it, and then the next to it, and next to it, and move, make its way down the neuron itself. But in this one particular spot, if we reach that negative 70 millivolts, the sodium channels open, sodium runs in, potassium's already in there, and so the inside becomes positive, and that leaves the outside negative. And so this is our depolarization. It's, it's depolarizing the membrane compared to what it was normally. You get this change in um, charges on either side of the membrane itself. Because of this, so this, this change in voltage is actually going to cause an effect 
on the membrane, uh, the gated channels next to it. So, so the membrane right beside it is going to see, okay, we've got this, this change in polarization beside it. So it was sitting at negative 70 here. And then this one started depolarizing, starting getting really positive on the inside. So this is then going to rise up to say negative 50. And then it's going to be able to allow those sodium ions to come in and it's going to get depolarized. And because it becomes positive on the inside, the negative 70 over here, this part of the membrane that's sitting at its resting potential negative 70, as these positives move in beside it, it's going to get triggered because it'll get up to, it'll be less negative because of the positive ions that are sort of accumulating near it. And then as soon as it gets to negative 70, they open up, these uh, positive ions move in, and so on and so on. And this is the wave of depolarization that is going to travel down the axon. This is how the signals get sent down the axon. The repolarization part, and again, for this particular area right here, um, again, once we get to the, 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 the depolarized state, um, these potassium channels are going to open up and potassium is going to move to the outside. That's going to start to reestablish this positive charge on the outside as the potassiums move. Um, and we're going to get this less positive on the inside, so it starts to reform negative on the inside here. And this is going to be our repolarization. Um, so the potassium ions are rushing out, and this is going to make it positive on the outside again and negative on the inside. This reestablishes our resting potential. Now the sodium-potassium pumps are going to have to reestablish that it is specifically sodium ions on the outside and potassium ions on the inside, but more sodiums on the outside than potassiums on the inside. So this gives us our resting potential of our positive ions on the outside. Since this whole depolarization and this action potential in one particular area takes a while to go through, these sodium channels are, are well, they, they close up, they actually stay closed for a little while. And so there's this refractory period where this part of the membrane, right after it is fired, it cannot fire again. So even though the part next to it, let's put that in a square, so even though the part next to it is starting to become positive on the inside, this will trigger this let's I'll do a triangle here um, this part further on will eventually get depolarized and you'll see this signaling but it cannot work backwards towards the original part because that that original part of the membrane that first got depolarized has this refractory period where it cannot fire again it's got a slight delay in when it can actually fire again the refractory period and therefore the signal can move in only one direction so this is the action potential with what is happening at the membrane portion that is going through the active potential. So normally resting potential, you're sitting at your negative 70 millivolts. We've got the sodium potassium pumps maintaining more sodiums on the outside than there are potassium to the inside. Therefore, the inside is negative and the outside is positive to the extent of negative 70 millivolts. Some sort of stimulus triggers the nerve cell to allow some ions in to change the resting potential or change the potential to about 50-ish. If, if it makes it past 50, we'll definitely get a firing, um, an action potential, because if you get past 50 millivolts, the sodium gates will open up and sodium is going to come flooding into the inside of the nerve cell. And there's potassium there already. You throw in a bunch of sodium. The depolarization is going to happen and you end up with a whole bunch of positive ions in the inside. And so now the inside of the, the uh, neuron is positive and the outside is going to be negative. This is when it's depolarized to the extent of somewhere around 30 millivolts. Um, then what's going to happen is the potassium gates are going to open and some of these positive ions are going to be allowed out. And so we get them moving out and as they move out this formerly um, positive inside negative outside is going to repolarize to the extent that we get um, our, our re-establishment of what the normal conditions are where we have the extra positives on the outside 
and fewer positive on the inside. There are also these negatively charged proteins in there, and so you end up with these negative charges on the inside, and eventually we, we, this repolarization goes a little too far. We get too many positives on the outside relative to the negative on the inside, uh, but that does reestablish, and we get our resting potential back at negative 70. The sodium-potassium pumps are going to have to kick in, and again, because we're removing the sodium, sorry, the potassium's out um, to, to repolarize the neuron, um, but then the sodium potassium pumps are going to re-establish where the sodium and the potassiums are and so we'll get back to having the extra sodiums on the outside um, and the potassiums on the inside but fewer of them so we have an overall positive charge on the outside and a negative charge on the inside and this is an all or none response so either we make it past um, and again different numbers depending on what diagram you're looking at but somewhere around negative 50 definitely if you get up to negative 50 um, you're going to have this firing happening um, if it is below that threshold it is just going to essentially reset back to its resting potential of negative 70. the neuron will not fire once it has begun depolarization it can't be stopped so essentially once that depolarization once that axe potential is going it is sent and that that part of the membrane is depolarized which then causes the next part of the membrane to become depolarized go through its action potential and the next and the next and the next so these action potentials here they're all the same when they fire there's no like strong action potential or weak action potential it is just an action potential and so if a signal is to be sent um, essentially with like more urgency um, you, you can't send a more intense action potential it's just there's only one type of action potential so what has to happen is that it has to be fired more often than um, if it is a more intense signal so the strength of the APs does not change and therefore it is the frequency of these action potentials that can change and so these action potentials are going to be um, making their way down the axon of the nerve cell and eventually we're going to get to the end of the nerve cell and this is where neurotransmitters can be released and again an action potential will cause that that release to happen um, so if you want to send a stronger signal you're going to have to send more of those action potentials and that in turn will lead to the release of more neurotransmitters and therefore you get a, a, a stronger signal being sent even though the action potentials themselves are all the same there are two ways these can travel along neurons one is called continuous conduction where essentially each portion of the cell membrane has to go through the action potential. So similar to dominoes falling, each single domino knocks over the next one, which then knocks over the next one, which then knocks over the next one, and eventually it makes its way down the neuron. Each part goes through an action potential, so that little part of the membrane goes through one, then the next one, then the next one, each one causing the next one to happen, and eventually it moves its way down. So that is continuous conduction. It is relatively fast but again each portion of the membrane has to be um, depolarized to get that signal to go there's another type called saltatory conduction and this is where the axons themselves are myelinated and what this allows for is this action potential essentially can't travel down the entire membrane of the, the axon and so instead it's going to because the axon itself is covered with these myelinated um, portions and the, the sheath here so where there is an action potential this this part in the the middle essentially isn't sending the signal and so the signal is able to jump these gaps in the myelinous sheath and therefore it is able to travel faster down the neuron so actually by not allowing the action potential to hit every portion of the membrane but instead forcing it to jump from one point to another there is actually a, a speeding up of the transmission signal for those action potentials. And so you can imagine as we do this, um, the, the change in potential here is, it doesn't have to be ca carried all the way through. It's gonna cause a change in potential a little further ahead and jumping down the axon, which will cause a change further ahead. And so you get this jumping, which is much faster than doing continuous conduction the chemical signals that these neurons are going to be sending to each other because remember the the signal itself can only travel down the axon of the nerve um, once it hits the end of the cell that's it the signal can't go any further using this voltage gradient system so there is this other system that involves 
transmission across a gap, synaptic transmission. And this uses these chemicals called neurotransmitters. They are the bridge between one neuron and the next. So the signal itself can travel down the axon of one neuron, but when it wants to jump to the next one, which it can then travel down its axon, it has to travel through that gap as chemical messengers between the two nerves itself. And so these, this synaptic transmission um, will essentially take the nerve impulse to the end of the cell, um, and then in which case we can actually have the release of these molecules, and so we have this vesicle transport of these molecules out of one nerve cell, and we have these receptors on the beginning of the next nerve cell, and so those chemicals are able to travel from one nerve cell to the other, carrying the message that way. These chemicals, when they get to the post-synaptic neuron, they then would begin this depolarization again, and the signal could be sent down that neuron as well, and so on and so on until the signal gets to where it needs to go. Um, this, this bridge in between is a great source for pharmaceutical intervention um, or adjustment because we can actually play around with either the chemicals themselves that are being transmitted or the signal receptors on the postsynaptic membrane and we can say block those and that would shut down the signal or we could put in new chemicals and they, they wouldn't have to come from a neuron but we could actually get them from somewhere else and they would interact with these um, receptors and they would send other signals along the message along the, these these neurons that the neurons themselves weren't weren't transmitting there are different ways that they can work so they can they can excite the uh, next one where they, they travel that message further and then add that to the next neuron itself or they can actually be inhibitory where they actually tell that neuron to okay we're going to need a little bit more signal before we actually continue that action potential through the next nerve